broadcaster, we are proud to present it once again for a brand new audience. While some re-editing has been done to update segments of the program, for the most part, it remains substantially as it was originally presented. And now we hope you enjoy A River Gone Wild 50 Years Ago. We interrupt our regular programming. A warning just received from the Louisville Weather Bureau says the Ohio Valley is facing the most alarming flood we have ever had on the Ohio River. If this rain should continue another 24 hours, which it doubtless will, the greatest flood in the history of the Ohio River and its tributaries is imminent. Warning, hold yourselves in readiness to move to higher ground on a moment's notice. And if the water is near any of your houses in lowlands, move out before nightfall. Warning, hold yourselves in readiness to move to higher ground on a moment's notice. And if the water is near any of your houses in lowlands, move out before nightfall. Twice in the lifetime of many citizens of Louisville, this city has been ravaged by devastating natural calamities. There was the horrendous tornado of 1974. And 50 years ago, the awesome flood of 1937. At that time, over 60% of the city was underwater, from Barrett Avenue in the east down to Shoney Park in the west. Broadway was a virtual lake. The trauma of the event was unforgettable. Thousands had to abandon their homes, often going out by boat with all their possessions left behind. There was a power failure, and the city was left in darkness. President Franklin D. Roosevelt received an urgent appeal from Mayor Neville Miller, and the president placed the War Department on a 24-hour alert and ordered in federal troops to maintain order and help combat panic and the fear of pestilence. Martial law was declared. the tornado of 1974, the flood of 1937 is one of those moments in history by which we mark time. What were you doing when you heard the news that the water was coming up your street, they'll ask, or I was in it. This program then will view a dramatic moment in Louisville's history, a natural calamity to rival that of the 1974 tornado in intensity and destruction. The rest of the country watched as we again were taught that raging disaster is no respecter of persons. its history, most notably in 1884 and again in 1913, but none as devastating as the one which struck with such force in 1937. This flood was triggered by torrential rains in early 1937 all over the Ohio Valley. Continuous rain with snow and sleet got underway in earnest about the first week in January. Day after day, the sky opened up and the rain poured down with such intensity as to call to mind the flood described in the Bible. By Friday, January 22nd, it was clear that this was no ordinary flood, but a major disaster in the making. The river was rising dramatically by the hour, and schools were closed at noon until further notice. The Ohio River would eventually reach a crest of 57.1 feet on the upper gauge. More than two-thirds of the city was about to be covered by water, and still the rains came. At 11.30 a.m. on Sunday, January 24th, called forever after by many Black Sunday, the waterside plant of the Louisville Gas and Electric Company was flooded out and the city went dark. More than 200 men had, according to a story in the emergency edition of the Courier Journal of January 25th, worked night and day caulking wall breaks and splits in the floor, all at great danger to their own lives. Water gushed in more rapidly than workmen could sandbag the new cracks and pumps were unable to handle the inrush. The pit filled and the workmen had to get out. John Hershenroder, who began his career as a cub reporter with the Courier Journal, <laughs> recalls vividly the experiences of the 1937 flood as if it were only yesterday. Very odd feeling. When I finally got back in after four, being four days marooned in the near west end, I was just a block east of 18th Street, which was 
they said everybody should be evacuated west of 18th Street. Uh, when I got back in the first night, of course, no transportation. I walked, and it was a, a very eerie feeling. No lights, no streetcars, no people on the street, no sound. It's like a ghost town. And I walked down the middle of the street. I walked the several miles after after working in that night and then and then after the water started going down 4th Street which is now the mall River <laughs> City Mall uh, this noise of, of pumps pumping water out of basements all all m day and night through 4th Street was and throwing the water out of getting it out of the basements after the water went down of course the Brown hotels which is now the Brown Education Center had this marker you know what showed the water about Oh, I get three feet deep there at Fort and Broadway. And there were things put out on radio. I remember one story about, of course, they built the pontoon bridge up at Baxter there at the, at the head of, you know, where Jefferson goes on up. They built a, a pontoon bridge out of whiskey barrels. Mm -hmm. And they put out this radio call to uh, please bring the empty whiskey barrels to the Baptist Seminary. <laughs> <laughs> Did they? <laughs> yeah, they provided the barrels. And of course, this was an escape, the only escape route from downtown, really, after the water came bridge. up, yeah. Well, as I say, I was marooned in this in the west, in the, in the near 18th and Market, 17th and Market, on the second floor for three or four days, and one night, my phone was still in operation and I could get to it, and uh, one night the office called me and asked me if I could go cover this fire, and I said, well, there are no boats passing near this hour of the night, I'm sorry, I can't do anything for you, but uh, about tenths and around, there was a large fire, I and mean, you could see the blaze, and, and I was busy trying to calm some of the people down who lived in other second floors along there because they, they got the rumor around that the river was on fire from oil on the river. There were, there were numerous rumors because of the lack of communication. A lot of rumors about people drowned, and there, were, there weren't any drownings, really. A number of people died, but from the natural causes. They had moved, uh, they had made the uh, Barrett Junior High School a, a temporary hospital, for instance. And uh, There was uh, talk that they were digging mass graves in they Cave did. Hill. They, there was a picture. They dug a mass grave in Cave Hill, but it was never used. I tell you what you remembered mostly was pianos. People in the West End, they throw the keys that come off, you know, here, this be a pile of, of debris out front, and of course it was all, and the Red Cross did a tremendous job in providing people with, uh, well, the whole rest of the country came to the, the donated to the Red Cross, and they, they, they replaced furniture for a, a great many people in the West End. I, I was picture editor at the time uh, on, the, on the Curry Journal, and one of the photographs we put in the paper that's been picked up many times, and you may have seen it, it, they were evacuating a family from a porch roof of a second floor around 19th and Broadway. And they had a, the family was carrying a cage with their either canary or parrot. <laughs> that was used all over the country. Was it? The amazing thing, Wilson, was the, the people in the communities in out in Kentucky and southern Indiana, who took these people into their homes. And, and of course, they left with few belongings, a lot of them. I think probably the outstanding thing was the reaction of the people, particularly the people who had to be evacuated. And, still only an experiment in 1937, a dream in the minds of its promoters. But radio played a major role during the flood. In those tension-filled days, radio stations devoted their time on the air to broadcasting calls for help. Send a boat became a familiar phrase throughout the country. When the electricity went out, WHAS was hooked up by telephone to WSM in Nashville, Tennessee, and the distress calls went on so that rescue units with battery radios could receive the messages. And so the work continued. Many families had to leave their homes, usually stepping from an upstairs window into a boat, and were taken to higher ground. 
Refugee centers were established in the Crescent Hill and St. Matthews areas. The Jefferson County Armory, now the Louisville Gardens, and City Hall were by some miracle on dry land, and refugees were moved into those areas also. It was at City Hall that Mayor Neville Miller organized his disaster committee and where they held their meetings. The call went out to other cities around the United States for help, and the response was heartwarming and overwhelming. On Long Island, a score of boats left their bases and set out for Far Rockaway, there to be placed on railroad cars for the trip to the Midwest. Cots, blankets, food, medicines, and other supplies were flown or transported by boat, rail, or truck. Over 200 policemen from Pittsburgh, Boston, Philadelphia, and Chicago were airlifted into Bowman Field, our only airport then, to assist Louisville policemen in patrolling the area. It was announced that looters would be shot on sight. Elements of the 11th Infantry Division were encamped at the airfield. When the Louisville Water Company's pumping station went out of operation, thousands had to catch water in barrels or whatever they could find. Sometimes snow was melted for coffee. The water remaining in the reservoir was rationed. Water was turned on twice a day for a brief time. Inoculation points were set up by the neighborhood firehouses and all citizens were urged to get their typhoid shots. Doctors worked tirelessly without compensation. It was a time when everybody pitched in. What Life magazine called the greatest flood in the history of the United States. Marjorie, you were and are a, a, a worker. Uh, you made a career uh, with the Red Cross, is that's, that right? That's right, and it's been a wonderful career. I guess uh, the, uh, the damage, the, the amount of money involved in that uh, great flood of 1937, uh, I know it ran into the millions. Uh, was it, it possibly didn't. one of the biggest it, disasters? It was of the that largest time? to ever hit the United States at that time and ranked still at the very top of the list of disasters in this country. The cost to the Red Cross of rehabilitation for the families, the emergency assistance and the rehabilitation of families was $25 million. If you translate those $19.37, to today's dollars, you get some idea of the size yeah, of the it's operation. Probably 150 million. Being That's active. right. Mm -hmm. Five million of that was spent right here in Jefferson County. Uh, in spite of the fact that that flood was over the entire Ohio Valley, the worst hit place was probably right here in Louisville. That's correct. The 300 percent of the normal rainfall fell in Louisville. And this was the, the point of the greatest concentration. What was that? 165 billion tons of water fell on Louisville in 1937. Well, uh, 165 right. billion tons fell in the Ohio Valley. I, we got we most felt of like we got 165 we, billion tons. We came in. pretty close, didn't we? We, we had our share. Uh, you were trapped downtown, I understand. Uh, well, that that's time. right. I, I lived in the Highlands at the time, but I was a clerk with the Red Cross. And uh, the morning that I went in, I had no idea I would not get back home that night. Uh, that was but, uh, uh, then, at that time, the Red Cross was up over the Rialto Theater. We finally had to abandon that location, however, and we moved then down to where um, the Liberty National Bank is on Jefferson, Jefferson Street. Mm -hmm. It was then an abandoned store, the old Herman Strauss building. And that around the city hall in that area was sort of a little island, wasn't it? It was indeed, uh-huh. Uh -huh. So we could uh, get in and out uh, from there with And where did trouble. you sleep? Where did you stay? Well, we, we stayed at the Kentucky Hotel. And uh, and, of course, space to stay was at premium, too. Uh, so the three of us slept in one bed. And if one turned over, all three of us had to turn over, you know. And so you used kerosene lamps in, uh, in the that's, area where you were? That's right, uh -huh, at times. And uh, sometimes we uh, were able to get some electricity. And then the, we used uh, the gasoline uh, Coleman lamps at times, too, for light. Uh, shots you had to take? Uh, oh, I can remember. We, before we left 4th Street, everyone was getting shots, of course. Typhoid shots was... Uh, a very important thing, uh, and the phones were ringing so constantly. I remember I got my shot with the, the telephone. I had telephoneitis at that point, uh, but the nurse just came along and swabbed my arm and put the shot in with, without the phone ever leaving my ear. Downtown where you were trapped, uh, what did you do for water? They bring it in to you? They brought it in to us in the old whiskey barrels mm. that had been filled. That's, that was a different drink, I'll a say. A barrel of water. A right. barrel of water. Do you remember water, your first right. drink? I, I can. It was. I can remember the taste. I can't describe it, but I can still taste it at times. <laughs> Uh, and I, one of the other things, uh, we got, we drank a lot of grapefruit juice at that point because it, it was easy to bring in in cans, you know. And one morning, I re remember we had so many uh, uh, professional people who came in, and there's Red Cross workers who came in, not only Red Cross people, but people from other agencies who had been loaned to the organization for the period of the disaster. 
and one man, one morning the gentleman said that they had 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 to shave with grapefruit juice and so they had no water so they shaved with grapefruit juice what stands out in your mind uh, most of all about the 1937 flood i suppose the the tremendous number of people who were involved both as from the standpoint of being affected by the disaster and the 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 willingness of people to get in and help the response of people concern for others uh, this is always enheartening in any disaster but people from all walks of life couldn't do enough to help out and people from outside came the uh, oh indeed you were telling me about the pennsylvania state police oh yes the uh, who were quartered at the pendennis club uh, as we said the pendennis will probably not be the same again but it's a marked history that they will probably look back on for a long long time mm -hmm. but people from all over the nation responded to not only to Louisville, but to all up and down the Ohio Valley. Perhaps the unsung heroes were the men who manned those boats. Oh, they were indeed. And went to the homes they and got people indeed. out. They took food to them, as well as those people who could stay in their homes. They took the people out who had to be evacuated, usually at the last minute. Yeah, we don't know those names No, of those we men, don't know those names. But they were heroes. You'll run across them every once in a while, and they'll, they'll laugh and tell the stories. Like old war tales, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it was fun, uh, and yet it was very serious business. And they, they were eager to do it. I, I cannot recall the number of boats that had to be uh, corralled, boats that were here. People donated their boats. If they had them, the Red Cross had some stored for many years after this. The Coast Guard brought in boats. There were boats that had to be built. Uh, in fact, there were some seagoing vessels in the, in the, uh, somewhere in the valley. I don't, don't recall whether they were any in Louisville or not, but there were even some seagoing vessels. The water was that deep. After Black Sunday, the rain continued to fall, but with the massive assistance beginning to be felt, the situation did not appear to be quite so hopeless. By Tuesday, January 26th, the Corps of Engineers and scores of volunteers working night and day had constructed a pontoon bridge from Johnson and Jefferson Streets to Barrett Avenue. Supported by whiskey barrels, the amazing bridge made it possible to transport routed West End refugees down the lake, which once was Broadway, and hence across the pontoon bridge to higher ground in Crescent Hill. About Wednesday, January 27th, the rain stopped, but tension remained high. Men were weary, families were separated. Many workers, particularly those involved with the bridge, had not shaved, eaten a hot meal, or slept in a bed for days. The damage was done. The river, like the people, was spent. But it didn't surrender easily. Nevertheless, the raging river did start to slowly, very slowly, go down. On Friday, it had receded by about a foot. Eight days after the dark, eerie Sunday of January 24th, the river was down to 51.5 feet. As the river receded, the sight of the emerging mud and debris was shocking. The most monumental cleanup in Louisville's history was about to begin. But at least, the awful memory of the flood, like the river itself, was commencing to subside. Whether it could happen again or not, those who endured the 1937 flood would be destined to be jittery every year thereafter, when the winter and spring rains caused the river to rise. Would the flood come again? Well, a person could only say then with some certainty. Let's hope not. Chuck Schumann is Assistant Information Officer for the United States Army Corps of Engineers. That is the title, isn't it? That's correct. And they were very, very active in the 1937 flood, Chuck. I guess the big question is, could the 1937 flood or one like it come again? Well, let's take first the 1937 flood. If you had an exact duplication of the rainfall, the weather conditions, and the situation of 1937 to repeat, you would not have the massive damage because of programs and uh, projects that have been built and completed since that time. You would not have the damage. You would have a flood, but not the damage. Uh, the question of... Uh, flood of equal proportions, this is always a potential when you're talking about a river. A river is going to flood. This is a natural phenomenon of a river, and uh, the weather, the amount of rain, the situation will, will determine 
how great it's going to be. Are you saying then that the water would never get, say, to Fourth and Broadway three feet deep the way it did? Not uh, with the similar patterns and uh, with the flood wall protection that you have here in Louisville. It would require a flood of such magnitude that it's almost inconceivable. The 37 flood is considered a flood of record. In 1938, just a year after the terrible flood, Lewis Bromfield published a new novel entitled The Rains Came. Many Louisvillians thought it was about Louisville in 1937. It wasn't. But it's doubtful if the monsoons in India, which is what the novel was really about, could have been any worse than what happened in the Ohio Valley. For those who lived through it, the 1937 flood left an indelible imprint upon their minds and imaginations. Exciting? Yes. Frightening? Yes, definitely but memorable and somehow satisfying because they shared a common experience with others. They were in it and they survived. been watching A River Gone Wild 50 years ago, a presentation of WDRB-TV that originally aired in 1977. We hope you've enjoyed this award-winning documentary commemorating the 50th anniversary of Louisville's greatest natural disaster. of the swollen Ohio practically engulfs Louisville in its race to the Mississippi. Here is one of the most astounding situations in the history of American catastrophes. More than 230,000 people, two-thirds of the great city's population, routed from their homes. As it offered little consolation, but Louisville was not alone. The devastation reached for hundreds of miles along the mighty Ohio, leaving hundreds dead and millions in damages. But with the fighting spirit of a young river city, Louisville pulled together to do battle. And at a sandbag city hall, an island in a fast disappearing town, a fight began against the most devastating flood in American history. I'm Gary Rodemeyer. I'm Melissa Forsyth. In 1937, City Hall was one of the few dry places in downtown. This served as a nerve center for a city under martial law. Tonight, we'll take you back to 1937. We'll find out what happened and why. We'll let the flood survivors tell their story, and we'll find out if it could ever happen again. We'll be back in just a moment with memories of the 37 flood 50 years later. Louisville was no stranger to floods. In fact, the Ohio had left its banks just the year before. When the relentless rains began in mid-January, few believed it could happen again so soon. But as the water steadily rose, the fear grew that Louisville would soon be in deep trouble. Here are startling scenes of the city's great West End residential section, now a veritable American Venice, but a Venice without people. In this one section, more than people were not prepared. There was no way they could be prepared. They had a carrot aside on his back because the water was out all the way in the backyard to the alley. And we had a place to sleep, and we were warm, and we, we just stayed. After the flood, all you had was foundation after foundation after foundation. The house is completely gone. The very waters of to thousands of Louisvillians, the story of the 1937 flood became their story, as the waters reached where no flood had gone before or has gone since. 230,000 people evacuated the city. Some went to hastily prepared tent cities, but most crowded into railroad boxcars, not realizing they would end up as far as Detroit or Memphis. The Louisvillians were not alone. A total of 800,000 people living along the 980 miles of the Ohio fled the rising waters. While thousands left, thousands and stayed. Hallie Pirtle spent 13 days in the second floor of this River Park Drive store. 
She remembers well the day she looked down River Park to see a press boat coming her way. A short time later, she, her husband, and neighbors posed on the roof of her flooded home for what has become probably the most famous picture of the 37 flood. The parrot in the foreground, she says, they rescued after someone left it behind. What did you all do with this parrot once you got it? Taught it Tyler help, sing glory, glory, hallelujah. Did it do it? Yes, it did. It nearly drove us crazy. <laughs> How would you like to hear help, help, help all night long? <laughs> The work of Those who found dry ground in Louisville also found martial law. Army soldiers trying to bring some semblance of order to a chaotic situation. On what became known as Black Sunday, the 24th of January, almost half the city was underwater. Most utilities were out, and WHAS radio went off the air temporarily. Those stranded in their homes depended on WHAS for information and company. Relief workers used the station to dispatch rescue and aid boats. You heard that just constantly, send a boat here, send a boat there. Hundreds of boats helped with evacuations, and to those who elected to stay behind, they brought food, clothing, and medical supplies. As the river climbed to eventually cover 70% of Louisville, thousands escaped the inundation by crossing a bridge ingeniously floated on whiskey barrels. It went to the Crescent Hill and Highlands area. From Sandbag City Hall, Mayor Neville Miller called for help. Police came from all over the country to relieve exhausted Louisville officers. Likewise, doctors and nurses came to vaccinate the city against typhoid. And food and medical supplies came by the plane load. Louisville also is threatened by fire. The massive fire in the Louisville Varnish Company at the peak of the flood could be seen for miles. Most who saw the fire's crimson glow were marooned with no way of knowing what was happening. Among them, 200 people packed into the clubhouse of flooded Churchill Downs. We heard that... It was a big fire downtown that burned out half the West End. Not all the flooded cities were along the Ohio River. Frankfurt was hit hard. Among other things, the state prison flooded, touching off a riot and the escape of 40 inmates. At 2 o'clock in the morning on January 27th, a Wednesday, the water reached its crest here in Louisville at 57.1 feet. It hovered at that level for 13 hours before finally starting to fall. For many, the falling waters revealed they had nothing to go home to. I think the ANP let us have a little money and uh, Red Cross maybe 350 or something like that and then start, a, start all over again. In all, 33,000 homes were damaged or destroyed. The death toll from the 37 flood in Louisville is questionable. The figures range from a half dozen to 200. Ten deaths came during the cleanup when a gas explosion ripped through a coffee company at Floyd and Market. The disaster just seemed to illustrate that while the water was gone, the effects of the 1937 flood would be felt for a long time. And in some ways, we are still feeling them today. Boats that were savers a few days ago. Jeffersonville, Indiana was the hardest hit of the fall cities. The newsreels told the story. Ninety-five percent of Jeffersonville and Clarksville were underwater. Their populations dropped from 15 to 3,000, as many residents were evacuated north on trains. Scottsburg, Seymour, and Bedford accepted refugees. Boats rescued others and took them to high ground schools and churches for safety. Some people spent three weeks sleeping on church benches. It was remarkable the way people helped each other. Ed Coots Sr. was appointed acting mayor of Jeffersonville during the crisis. The real mayor was vacationing in Florida and couldn't get back because of the water. Coots remembers the terrible force of the flood's current. I looked out the front door and there's a car going down the street, and I thought, wonder who in the world could be driving that car? There wasn't a driver. The water was coming over with such pressure, it was just pushing the car down the street. The water in Jeffersonville got its deepest here at the corner of Court and Spring Street. The old-timers who remember say it reached 25 feet, which would put the water about in the middle of the second-story windows of this building. It was much the same in New Albany, as many remember. One night, all the lights went out, and you could hear the houses crashing against each other coming down and hitting the piers up on the k and Bridge, and just real eerie. Hundreds of people in East New Albany waited until the last minute before deciding to move, creating a struggle for boats to get them out. They'd always been told they were flood-proof. There was no worry about where they lived. 
But that whole water came up and it was over the roofs. When the water was finally gone, the masses returned to view the mud and destruction. The Red Cross set up a tent city. If there was any good news in the aftermath, it was the lack of any casualty. No flood-related deaths were reported in Jeffersonville, Clarksville, or New Albany. The historic disaster did teach Hoosiers something about the river. What the mighty Ohio leaves behind when it rises, it will return for. They would not be caught unprepared again. In Indiana and Kentucky, the rainfall was almost continuous for several weeks. That was the result of a rare combination of meteorological conditions. We've asked our Chuck Taylor to explain what happened. January 1937 featured very warm, moist air over the southeast portion of the country and cold air over the northern plains. A strong storm track developed between these two extremes with low pressure systems moving up from Texas into the Ohio Valley. A number of disturbances took this path with very heavy rain coming into our part of the country. The first big storm hit on the 6th of January with other storms following every few days. Between the 20th and 24th, we had over 10 inches of rain. The total for the month was 19.17 inches, an all-time monthly record, and roughly six months of rainfall in a 31-day period. Cincinnati had a record 13.6 inches of rain, and all that heavy runoff coming down the river helped to cause the flooding. And to complicate matters after the flooding, there was a very cold, snowy month of February with almost seven inches of snowfall. How would you like one of those to float into your backyard? Tank cars on the loose and other leaking gas tanks still threaten Louisville with the same fire hazard that struck the Cincinnati waterfront. The 37 flood was a breeding ground for rumors. One of those rumors said that hundreds of people had drowned. It was not true. But the big fear for the city was an outbreak of typhoid fever. Here at Cave Hill Cemetery, the city secretly had a mass grave dug for typhoid victims. But that grave was never used. Not one person died of typhoid. This is how Louisville's disaster played in movie houses across the country in a universal newsreel. City, state, and government forces have mobilized to care for the flood victims and to fight the twin specters of want and disease. With polluted water everywhere that leaves a deadly slime as it recedes, only the greatest effort can prevent typhoid, dysentery, and other grave ailments. Yes, the water is going down, but not as fast as it came up. The flood crest has passed Louisville, but it will be many days before the city has dried out, before normal life can be resumed in this great metropolis, where more than 200,000 were made homeless. In the face of flood damage, fire, and other disaster, the main thought now is for sanitation and relief and water. Fresh drinking water for a water-soaked, waterless town. lives so far lost through the flood in Louisville alone, and there'll be more. An experience so terrible is bound to take its toll. Terror, exposure, misery, and contagion. The shock troops of disaster are still rolling up their sad totals. But a new force is now in the field, the shock troops of relief, here by the hundreds from all parts of the country to help the people of Louisville on the road to recovery. The expanse of the flood was just unbelievable. 70% of the city was covered by water. The Ohio River was 25 miles wide at one point. Thousands of people were driven from their homes. Those hard facts and numbers aren't easy for us to grasp 50 years later, but get together a group of older Louisvillians, as we did recently at the Portland Museum, and listen to it all come back in a flood of memories. <laughs> <laughs> so we came to Louisville and we came over on the Big Four train. I think it was the Big Four. And that's the only time I got scared. The water on that bridge, I mean, there was railroad trains seemed to be sitting right in the midst of that flood. And you couldn't look up the river or you couldn't look down the river that there was nothing but water. 
all the animals, all the chickens and everything was at life. It's 12 o'clock at midnight. The roosters was crowing, the cows was mooing, the horses was neighing, and whatever. Everything could feel the sense of death. I got a boat and went out, and my house was completely submerged. I turned out there and stuck the oar down in it, water, to see if it was still there. I think the rumors were more frightening than really what was happening. Somebody had started a rumor about the dam had given away above, and this was going to be the last move for us to make. A Sunday afternoon, they came on the radio that if we didn't get out and there was a fire, we'd all be trapped, and there was no way if we didn't get out then that was our last chance. My father was the only one who knew really where we were going. With three hysterical women, I feel sorry. I felt sorry for him. Were you really hysterical? After three days of seeing the water coming in on all sides, fires, and what have you, it, it really was. I was feeding people up and down Broadway, Shelby Street, and Preston Street. How'd you get the food? We broke in store and got it. <laughs> no sooner than I crossed the street there at uh, th Fourth and Walnut, one of the sewer caps blew up and the water started coming out. And I thought, well, this is something. I'll go home and see how it is. But anyway, we ended up going, getting on the train. That's something that I saw that I never will forget. <coughs> they had the long cars with open doors and it was crowded in there like siding. That was the time when race, prejudice, and everything was forgotten. It was black and white in them cars. Yeah. We were all one, trying to go for and save our lives. I think that I've drawn from it most of the rest of my life. Uh, we cared for other people. We saw that others were taken care of. It's uh, nice to be a part of history, so to speak. Then there was a pontoon bridge built. You know, the engineers built a pontoon bridge. And that's another funny story. They used whiskey barrels for the... And uh, WHS put out on the radio, send the whiskey barrels to the Southern Baptist Seminary. <laughs> Back where it belonged, and the 37 flood was history. But people still had to contend with millions in damages and a mind-boggling mess. WPA workers were put into action to scrub, bale, and toss out what the flood left behind. This is what the cleanup activity looked like in a 1937 newsreel. The flood crest is past, and the city's beginning to dry out. The worst is over, except for sickness and contagion. But what a gigantic job faces the stricken population. A beautiful city now piled high with trash flotsam from the backwaters of the record inundation. And only gradually, a few at a time, are the people getting permission to return to their homes. Danger's not over yet. Many cave-ins give evidence of weakened foundations and unsafe buildings. But the big job is bailing out. It's like trying to pump out the ocean. The city's fairly filled with pumps, big pumps and little pumps, trying to put the Ohio River back to bed. Bucket brigades are doing a big share of the job, though. Ah, they have sit-downers here, too. One of the most curious aftermaths of the flood, boats that were lifesavers a few days ago. Now they're just in the way. A lineup of volunteers in a new kind of army. An army of WPA workers being formed to attack the mud and debris left by the flood in Louisville, Kentucky. And there's plenty of it, and a giant task to be done before Louisville can erase the scars of the record inundation. The flood cleanup was nearing completion. Things were getting back to normal. And the collective thought up and down the Ohio River was never again. This, then, was the legacy of the 1937 flood, the system of levees and walls that now surrounds the city of Louisville and provides flood protection. 
For 30 miles, it stretches through Jefferson County like a serpentine monument to the flood. Using 1937 as the flood of record, engineers added three feet, and man created the flood wall. In cities, it is just that, a wall of concrete and steel fastened to bedrock. In rural areas, it's an earthen levee made of impervious clay that won't let the water soak through. From Pittsburgh to Paducah, flood walls now ring 87 cities. Chuck Schumann of the Corps of Engineers recalls it took 30 years and $100 million to build the Louisville Wall, but public sentiment demanded it. There was a great deal of emphasis placed on the political leaders to do something to prevent the 37 flood from ever occurring again. It was 10 years before flood wall construction would begin, and 10 years after that before completion in 1957. But the wall still left holes to accommodate everyday life. When high water threatens, gates are installed to fill the gaps. And in 1964, that led to a crucial mistake. They didn't get the closure here at 7th Street in, and so you had some flood damage that resulted, not from failure of the wall, but failure to close the wall up properly. It's now the Metropolitan Sewer District's job to close all 50 floodgates. MSD took over the job just this month. So new crews are practicing with the flood wall gates, learning to install them in time in the right place. We've got to get some hands-on experience and find out what kind of problems we may encounter because when the time comes to put them in, they've got to go in. Carl Neumeyer says it would take about four days to put all the flood wall closures into place. And this first practice run at Quincy and Webster in Butchertown, the crew closed the gap in five hours. The practice was termed a success. And after 30 years of construction, there is still work to do. In southwest Jefferson County, the last stretch of levee is being constructed to protect an area that was only farmland in 1937. Today, homes and businesses fill that area, and when the work is complete, they too will be protected from a recurrence of the wet winter of 1937. Even from our perspective, half a century later, the story of the flood has impaled. Families have handed down their memories, like treasured heirlooms. And the community has endured more tragedies since then, killing cold and heat, tornadoes, racial violence, and more. But somehow, the people always meet those challenges and go on, changed by their history, but building on it, too. Thanks for watching. Good night. Already above flood state. You keep the river going river. your way. I'll keep going my way. River, stay away from the door. Rain, river 57 feet, rising wind. I just got a cabin. You don't need my cabin. We didn't realize how strong the current was, but it took so many houses off of their foundation. Don't come up any higher. I'm so all alone. Leave the bed and the fire. That is all I own. This here bridge is three quarters of a mile long, and a lot of you folks don't start marching over it and step. You're liable to shake it to pieces. Why don't you all build it there? Get along. Well, the United States Army built this bridge on empty whiskey battles in 36 hours. I ain't breaking your heart. Don't you start breaking my heart. River, stay away from the door. Urgent. Send boats to 672. Get away, get away, roll away, stay away, you dirty.